Okay, we're broadcasting. Okay. And uh, let me just start the, okay. Hi everybody, this is Trent Blizzard uh, with Modern Forager and I'm here with Kristen. Say hi, Kristen. Hey everyone. And uh, we're doing another episode tonight of Modern Forager Stories with Julie Schreiber. And say hi, Julie. Hi there. Um, so this is going to be a, a fun episode today. We have 90 minutes to talk about candy caps. And uh, if you haven't had candy caps, they are a, an amazing and unique mushroom, which we're going to do a, a really deep dive into. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, finding them and uh, preserving them and eating them and some recipes and look at some pictures and, and all kinds of good stuff. And we're going to do that with Julie. And um, uh, Julie, we met, we met earlier this year at, at an event and she amazed us with a, a, a crazy good meal that just blew our minds at Soma. And we've kind of connected with her since and shared recipes and, and thought it would be fun to bring her on here because she's truly an expert. Um, so uh, before we move on, I, 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 it's hard to say you have, you have three degrees. You have a, uh, a degree in uh, hotel and restaurant management and then a yes. culinary arts degree, I think, from yes. uh, CIA um, yep. in Hyde Park. And then you have a third degree in enology, enology from UC Davis, which is, you know, kind of well known for, for <laughs> enology. So uh, um, do you know what it means, though? <laughs> uh, is it the gr is it the. It has to do with growing grapes. Ah, that would be viticulture. Viticulture, Eno okay. Enology is the study of fermentation. Oh, fermentation. Oh. So I, I guess that's a no. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Me either. That's all right. Keep going. <laughs> <clears throat> whatever, whatever you were telling about my background, I'm happy. I'm happy to listen. <laughs> Well, it was definitely uh, a lot of schooling. And uh, since then, though, um, Julie is really uh, uh, does three things pretty well uh, that I've figured out. Number one is she's an amazing cook, and she cooks for often uh, very large numbers of people. Uh, yeah, gatherings. She, for her to share a recipe with us, she has to scale it down. Um, <laughs> uh, she makes apparently pretty good wine. I'm not really an expert on that. Um, and I know that's a big part of your career. And then thirdly, you chase mushrooms and you actually take people on, on guided, guided tours. Uh, okay. We have a couple of websites here, Julie. Let me uh, just pop them open here. Okay. Um, and just to share with everybody who wants to kind of know more about you, uh, we have Shay Julie S. Did I say yes. that right? Dot com? You did, yes. Uh huh. Okay. And this is kind of your, your personal website, your personal That's brand. That's right. Yeah. And we have the Myco Ventures website. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about Myco Ventures. So uh, Myco Ventures uh, started out its life as a uh, wild about mushrooms with uh, Charmoon Richardson. Um, he's pretty well known here in Sonoma County. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, several years ago. Uh, but his partner was David Campbell, and I'm partners with him now. So we have uh, various events that we do in um, domestically and internationally. So in the fall, we do forays uh, to the Sonoma Coast, mostly occasionally to Point Reyes area as well. So like a half day event where we forage, and then I cook up whatever edibles we find. And so we cook them all the same way. So what you're tasting is the difference between the different mushrooms. And then we also do kind of a mushroom ID table. Uh, so that's kind of uh, November to March timeframe. And then uh, we do a morale foray, uh, at least one a year in um, the Sierra foothills. So we usually do that in May or June. And then uh, David also does trips to uh, Croatia and Italy. Uh, where they do some foraging, eat some truffles, uh, eat some more truffles, <laughs> and uh, have some good wine and that sort of thing. And unfortunately, since I make wine, I, I can't go on, on the international trips, but uh, I'm involved in all the domestic ones. And occasionally we do uh, private forays for people as well. So if somebody has private property 
and they really want to know what they have on their property, we'll, we'll go and forage with them and teach them a little bit about what they have in their particular location. Sounds what, amazing. Yeah, should be. It's usually pretty fun. It's a pretty nice kind of career path you're on for, I think, a lot of us <laughs> probably watching this webinar. Right? It's, a, it's kind of yeah. sexy, uh, <laughs> wine and mushrooms. The, food. I would say food. My, my friends and family eat and drink very well. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I also do events with a company called uh, Relish, and they are located out of Healdsburg. It's called Relish Culinary Adventures. So we do uh, like a two-hour hike, and then I make a four-course lunch, and we can come back to Relish, and we do uh, have the lunch, and then I do a cooking demo and show people how to cook mushrooms there as well. So uh, this year we did that five times, but it just depends. Uh, sometimes I also do um, private events with Relish as well. So it's kind of a nice mix of wine and food in my life these days. Yeah. yeah. We, we have a hard time getting out with, with um, kind of groups like that here in Colorado. Uh -huh. um, has a lot to do with just the permits on the, the Forest Service. They, they're, you can't we really have uh, challenges here with permits as well. Uh, Salt Point doesn't require a permit. Uh, so it's a very popular place for people to go. Uh, if you go to Jackson State Forest up in Mendocino County, they do require a permit, but um, it's not too hard to get. So um, I think the hardest part is I think they're only open Monday through Friday. So you've got to drive up on a Friday afternoon to get the permit. But um, yeah. So, and there are a lot of places you just can't go. So we love it when we find somebody that's got private property. It makes it way easier. <laughs> I bet. And, and for people listening, both those places, the uh, Salt Point state park which is north of san francisco what 90 minutes uh well i am about 60 miles north of the golden gate uh so just to get to my house from san francisco is a, roughly an hour yeah. and then um salt point you went on river road out to jenner out to the coast and went up highway one so it's probably about uh an hour and 15 minutes from my house going uh west and north so, okay, so it's not two, that it's, over two. Many, it's not that many miles it's just quite windy yeah it is windy yeah i always have to be driving otherwise i get sick on that road yeah 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 and then and jackson the, state forest is north of that another hour hour and a half maybe so usually uh, i'll go uh on 128 up to um mendocino so jackson state forest is um north of the city of mendocino uh to give you a rough idea of where it's at. Yeah. And those are those are both just like world-class mushroom hunting areas Absolutely. that we, we have been to both of those. Um, yeah. And, so, and look forward to coming back. Here's a little trivia about Jackson State Forest. So when I was first in California, I worked at Cafe Beaujolais in the town of Mendocino and I lived in Fort Bragg. So that was the first place I learned to forage was in at Jackson State, yeah. Okay, so. It's, it's a nice place to start. <laughs> uh, we probably need to do a little bit of housekeeping uh, uh, for a minute or two. Uh, we have a lot of people on the webinar. Welcome everybody. And we also have, uh, we're supposed to have Facebook going on. Um, I can't tell, if, I can't really look at it right now to see if it's going, so I might have to to test that out but um, if you're watching this you can chat we have a, a chat function feel free you can uh, right now maybe say hi tell us uh, tell us who you are and, and where you're from I see Roxanne um, uh, asking something about purslane for salads um, I'm not sure about that um, and then we also have a Q&A and you can put in uh, uh, chats in the Q&A as well so that works I guess that's good. Um, I may try to see if we have the Facebook live event going here, going here meanwhile. Okay. Um, um, so before we kind of jump into uh, candy caps um, and finding them, do you think you could give us just kind of a quick rundown of, of the Northern California kind of scene, maybe like the, the, the one minute overview? 
Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, what's like, where do you, what, what's the, <laughs> what's the season look like? I, I think what I'm really <laughs> interested in is the, the season there um, is different. Uh, and a lot of people, unless you live there, don't really know when, when you hunt there. Well, uh, actually right now, I would say we're going into the mountains. So we're either in the uh, Sierra foothills all the way from, uh, I would say Yosemite up to uh, some people are in Shasta this week. Uh, and so we find totally different mushrooms in the springtime, even though it's the end of May and we still think of this as spring. And so um, I would say people are hunting for morels and they're hunting for uh, butter bowl eats and they're hunting for spring kings like uh, Rex Veris. So they um, are finding those because the snow is melting. So when you go up to the higher elevations, we talk a lot about that when we're hunting for morels is what, how high you have to go. So I would say right now, people are probably foraging at 5,500 feet, 6,000 feet, which to you probably feels low. <laughs> but uh, to us, when you start at sea level, um, that's a, a yeah. good distance up. So uh, as the snow melts, there are different types of mushrooms that are coming up because then we have water. So it's, we're at about 54% of normal for rainfall. So uh, it's actually quite difficult to go foraging, say, at Salt Point right now. There just isn't the humidity that you would need uh, to get mushrooms. And maybe there's something out there, but really nobody's hunting on the coast right now. And then uh, we kind of take a break during the summertime. Uh, however, I do know some people that will hunt for morels in the uh, foothills all the way until August or September. So if you're an avid morel person, you can keep going all summer long, but every, everyone else has given up hope. So you have a whole place to yourself. Yeah. Um, just, and then, just go higher, right? Just keep yeah, going higher. Exactly. So you're just kind of thinking about moisture level. And uh, so the higher you go, the more opportunities you have. And we're hunting morels where the forest fires were. So that gives you an idea of, of uh, the location changes every year. Um, and then as far as the fall, uh, I'm thinking I'm making wine until Thanksgiving, <laughs> but the rest of the mushroom folks are starting to forage probably in October, whenever the first rains come and the, they'll go through uh, February, March, something like that. Uh, so we kind of have two different seasons, depends on what location you're going to. I've never seen morels for $189. That's crazy. <laughs> Wowza. That's crazy, I've Roxanne. Them, I've seen them for $40 a pound, but I've, I've never seen them for $189. Other mushrooms, for sure. <clears throat> well, maybe, maybe she's talking about uh, dried ones. That I'm not really sure what they charge for that. And so I picked them myself. But if you calculate the number of miles I drove uh, last <laughs> week, uh, it was a four hour drive and then uh, the amount of gas I had to pay for and the food I brought, maybe it is 189. <laughs> yeah, the opportunity cost of your time, uh, right? Yeah. Add it all up. <laughs> yeah, I try <laughs> not to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of us do. <laughs> no, no calculating that. <laughs> So then um, that's the, the, all the spring action. Um, then we kind of slows down in the summer. Let's talk a little bit more about the fall and, and kind yeah, of ease so, the candy uh, caps. An interesting thing about um, what happens here, and I always relate it to wine grapes because that's what I know. But uh, if you were thinking about harvest and wine grapes, we have the picking in sequential order. So like sparkling wine, you pick first and then Sauvignon Blanc, and then Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And at the end, kind of October time frame, we pick Cabernet. So this is just the sequence of how things ripen. And this is actually very similar in mushroom land. So you don't get all the mushrooms all the time. You get uh, certain mushrooms come up first. So usually the, the porcini come up first. And then as the season progresses, to me, uh, chanterelles, yellowfoots, black trumpets, candy caps, and hedgehogs are winter mushrooms, and they all kind of come up at the same time. So you, you can sort of say, oh, well, there's one of those out there, then you should be able to find the other ones as well. 
So uh, frequently, I'm picking all of those at the same time. And, and the dead of winter, so to speak. Right, because that's we have the most rain then. And uh, yeah, so if supposedly <laughs> last year was actually uh, a very difficult foraging year. We just didn't have that much moisture. Um, but the candy caps came, so which was great. Um, so I think you benefited. You were here at the right moment. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. I we think did. we did better, better on candy caps than any, anything else when we were there. Yeah. So yeah, we got lucky. It's definitely depends on the year, but um, because the habitat for candy caps is a little bit more varied than some of those other ones, um, it seems to be just a little bit easier. So you have more opportunity since they grow with uh, lots of different types of trees. Okay, well, let's, caps are. Uh, yeah, let's start talking about those. Um, <laughs> let's start at the, at the uh, um, like genus um, kind of area. It's a, it's a lactarius right. so mushroom. Right, so we'll step back even mm -hmm. one step further than that. So lactarius are in, in the Rushula family. So uh, Rushulas have the one distinct character trait for Rushula is they break like chalk. So if you were going to see one in the, in the woods, there, that's as a general practice, brush will break like that. So lactarius <clears throat> have a similar character trait. So they're part of the rush family. Uh, so then lactarius uh, produce a latex. So when you, if you took your finger and you went across the gills, it would actually break and you'd actually see a latex come out. So that's uh, particular to lactarius. And then- um, Yeah, it the, kind of bleed, it bleeds for anybody exactly. that isn't familiar with that. Yeah, or yeah. So you could say lactating, but it's yeah, lactate. not exactly right, <laughs> but it does produce milk. <laughs> so- um, I think it does. Yeah, so, and then um, lactarius rubidus is the one I believe we find here in Northern California, but some may debate me on that. There's a Lactarius rubidus and Rufulus. So the, those are the two. Um, but that particular mushroom is so distinct that, you know, when I see it across uh, so many feet away, I'm like, that's it. <laughs> I know that's it. There's, there's nothing else in my mind that looks like that. It looks like a candy cap. And we'll, we'll show some pictures here in a sec. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think, I, although I, I will say, you know, we, we just started picking them maybe, was it two years ago for the first time? And I wonder like how many times we walked by them. And, you know, it is kind of a little brownish, reddish mushroom. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think it's, you know, it's not big and charismatic. So, so once we started seeing them, we're like, oh, that kind of looks like a candy cap down there. And sure enough, it is. And, and then you mm -hmm. look around, you're like, oh, they're everywhere. They are <laughs> in a good year. Yeah. If you're lucky. I, I call that they're gregarious. So they're, ah. they're very friendly with each other. <laughs> uh, let's, yeah. uh, let's show a picture of here of, sure. of, of a kind of a, a little uh, cluster of gregarious yeah. um, candy caps. And t tell, me, tell me what you see here. So, uh, well, we've got several things going on. I would say the size of them is kind of maybe like from a dime to a quarter, maybe uh, a Sudhu the Anthony dollar kind of size. Um, so they're not really, really big. Uh, they also are, in this case, they're in habitat that's got uh, tan oak and uh, redwood. So it's kind of a, interesting, it's a, a mix. So I would say I'm usually luckier finding them in areas where uh, people walk a lot. So it's not like you have to go remotely into the woods. It's a lot of times they're on the trail where it's in the disturbed areas. So they seem to like that too. Okay, let me see if I can show this here then. So the, these leaves right here, these light ribbed leaves. Yeah. I think I, I'm trying to make my cursor visible. Um, yeah, I see your cursor here. Yeah. Okay, those are gonna be tan oaks. Yeah. Um, and there probably would be some acorns under here, right? If we really uh, looked. It's possible. It's yeah. possible, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then these these leaves right here, or not leaves, I guess. It's a that's um, a redwood uh, needle. needles, I guess. Redwood needles there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, and they're they're pretty nondescript. Uh, I, I don't know. 
There's well, a couple of things it? that uh, are interesting about that. So even if you were walking in a rainstorm, they would look like this. They would look dry on the top. So they actually have little fibrils on top. And so they always have a matte finish. They're never going to be shiny. Uh, they have kind of a cinnamon clove kind of a color to them. And if you turn them upside down, which I think you will in a minute. Yeah, let me, get, uh, let me they, hop into they that. They have a, yeah, they have a similar color underneath as well as on the top. So the, that color gives something away too. And then as you can kind of see here, they have uh, hollow stems. Mm -hmm. So I actually don't carry a knife with me when I'm hunting candy caps. I just use my thumb and I break them with my thumbnail. Um, so they break so easily, as I said, with like the, the Rushalas we were talking about before. Okay. So we can see a lot of that here. They're, they're the, the Rushala. So if you, you know, they are, br they're brittle. They're going to, they're going to snap. Yeah. Um, uh, they're uh, lact lactarious and you can't see that here, but if you ran your finger down the gills, they would exude a, a skim, uh, skim milk, skim milk. Yeah, skim uh, milk. type liquid. So uh, if, you, if you were looking at, um, uh, there's one lookalike that produces more of a whole milk uh, and it turns yellow. So you would pretty quickly uh, see the yellow. And th in this case, that would be, it wouldn't be a candy cap. And I also think, uh, to me, they have kind of a sweet aroma, uh, somewhere like fenugreek, but another friend of mine was saying today, she thinks it smells like a raw carrot, a little bit sweet in smell. So uh, they have a very distinct aroma. So it's always good to, to check them while you're picking them. It's easier than checking them when you get them home. Uh, that that really signature aroma of maple syrup, though, right when you pick them, it's not really evident, is it? No, absolutely not. Uh, it's a chemical reaction that takes place during the drying, so they don't have that aroma until they start to dry. Yeah, and I think Kristen, you have a question we want you to read here in a minute. Um, I notice, like when I'm picking them, uh, my hands start to smell like. 10 minutes after I start picking, like I pick uh -huh. one, I'm like, maybe, uh, maybe it's just a little bit of maple syrup and that kind of, I don't know what fenugreek smells like. So I'm not sure uh -huh. how to describe the smell. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I, I think it smells slightly sweet, uh, which is interesting because the mushroom itself doesn't taste sweet at all. Uh, but it gives, it gives an impression of sweetness. So I wouldn't go all the way to thinking it's um, uh, maple-y until you've dried them. Okay. And before we get into that smell, the other thing yeah. is when I pick them too, I notice that the top, the way it looks dry, it yeah. feels that way too. It's really coarse. I, I want to say yeah, almost like a cat's kinda, tongue. Yeah. It's got kind of fibrils on top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're kind of rough. Like, yeah. Um, so the whole, it's really weird how much they smell when you pick them. Um, I, I think we got, we got a question ahead of time from, was it D Denise? Kristen? Who, uh, who? Denisa, here. Let me see. Why don't you, let me uh, let me turn this off, and we can uh, take yep. a look at that question. I can read it. Um, except I lost it. I can get it here too if we need it. <sighs> yeah. Should we come back yeah. to it? Sorry, let me just, um, here. There it is. Okay. Um, so question that Denisa emailed to us, which we all loved, by the way. Thank you for this question. Or it's more like yeah. a little story slash question. Well, she says, like asked in advance. <laughs> yeah. She says, I would like to know the best way to rehydrate dried candy caps to prepare them for baking and any other uses for them. And then she goes on to say, last year, a relative sent me some, and I made Gary Linkoff's cookie recipe from his book. I sauteed them on the kitchen stove before adding them to the batter, and my entire house smelled like maple syrup and curry for three months. This is not an exaggeration. Um, not that this was bad, but it was intense. Nothing made the smell go away but time. And then after eating the cookies, the smell was also oozing out of her pores for days. 
the furniture and even the dog smelled like candy caps and she was surprised at the strength of the smell is this normal <laughs> julie is this normal this, this sounds like a self-help group uh, yes <laughs> it's it's quite normal i have baskets that i've used to forage candy caps that still smell like them like a decade later so as soon as i pick up that basket uh, i can smell them again Okay, so let's just pause right there and give everybody a couple of big tips on this. And okay. mine is don't collect candy caps in something that you value, um, <laughs> uh, like a hat like or it. your good I bag. Like <laughs> I did too. You know, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I'm like, oh, my bag smells so good. I love it. I smell candy caps. And then like the second day, I'm like, what's that smell? What's that smell? And, I, and now I can't, if you carry the bag through the woods, I smell candy caps every everywhere I go and I don't like it anymore. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> don't put well, them in it, your hat. It really messes with you when you're out hunting for morels or something and you know we're not even in candy cap territory. It's like I keep smelling candy caps. Where are they? I know, that's a good point. Yeah. So I, I put a little a bag weird. inside my bag um, and I put all my candy caps <laughs> in that one so that when they're they, they don't get any of their, their liquid onto the, my, my cloth bag. Um, Interesting. Okay. That, that's, that's what I do just cause I, I, I can't, I can't take the smell anymore. It ruins, it ruins things. <laughs> okay. So she, she talked about that. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many things in, in her question. So, <laughs> so uh, I agree that some people will actually take a candy cap and put it like in the ashtray in their car and then it's it's sort of scents your car so maybe you'd like that better than uh, your basket <laughs> but um so yes i've also uh warned people that if you eat something that i've made candy caps in that you will smell that way too so it actually will come out of your pores and you'll smell like candy caps for for days so i agree all of that is true <laughs> well, I, I think we, we had to eat a pretty large amount before that happened, I think. Like, not just like a, a little taste. I mean, I think we oh, made, okay. we made like scones and ate a whole bunch. Yeah, yeah. Because um, normally, the, at least the last couple of years, I've been making chocolate cake with creme anglaise and candy cap whipped cream. And uh, so that's a, a good plate, a good serving. And then, yes. To pretty much everyone <laughs> that I've, I've given that to is smelled like candy caps for days after that. <laughs> you, do you like to warn people or let them be surprised? Uh, uh, after they've eaten it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Technically, they are walking out the door and I thought, yeah. <laughs> is there a way to minimize the smell in your house after cooking them like that? Mm, Not really. I don't think so. Maybe you can... Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking you could cook them outside or something, but no, not really. I don't think. Yeah, I guess you could on a camp stove or something. Well, you know, it's like some people, when they fry their Thanksgiving turkey outside because they don't want the smell of the frying oil in their house. So I suppose you could, you could do something outside, but otherwise, I think it's just part of the thing. Yeah. Our, our house experience. didn't smell. Yeah, fortunately, it didn't make our house smell. And we've, we've cooked a lot of them up this winter. Uh -huh. um, I wonder, reading the question, one is she followed, uh, did she say, whose Gary recipe Lincoln's was it? Recipe. Gary's? Gary. Gary yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that recipe, but um, uh, I've seen, obviously, a lot of people make cookies with them. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as she was asking about rehydrating mushrooms uh, to use for cooking. So um, A... I use them fresh to do uh, savory preparations. I've made like a, a mushroom gravy to have with, uh, I don't know, I think the last time I did it, I had some pork, but you can do it with pork or duck or something like that. But it ends up tasting more like a curry rather than the maple, but quite delicious as a fresh mushroom, which is why I had that picture of them in the saute pan. Uh, so you can definitely cook them just as is. They're, they taste great. Um, if you were gonna cook them and they've been dried, uh, so if I'm doing like creme anglaise, uh, I, I decided to make it this way because years ago I made um, rose scented pound cake with rose geranium. And in that case, I had steeped the milk for the pound cake 
with the geranium for about half an hour. So you just bring it up to a simmer and then your whole pound cake smells like roses, which was lovely. So then I was like, okay, so candy caps, you could do the same thing. So I use whatever liquid you're using in your recipe. You can steep the mushrooms in them. So for the creme anglaise, I'll bring the, the cream up to a simmer and then put the mushrooms in it and let it sit for about half an hour. In my case, I strain them out. So uh, I know a lot of people will use like a coffee grinder and make more like a candy cap powder. And then they just add it as an ingredient into the recipe. And uh, I don't tend to do that. Um, I guess sometimes the candy caps are bitter. And um, so I don't really want that bitterness. I want the part I want, which is the nice maple character. And uh, so another thing I learned over the years is that the flavor doesn't dissipate from putting it in that cream. So I can strain them, rinse them off, freeze them, and use them again. So I've actually used them like four or five times in a row and still gotten the same flavor in the sauce that I wanted from the mushrooms. Oh, that, that's so, like an amazing tip right there. Yeah. <laughs> to reuse so, uh, that. I, but I know some people will use like um, the powder and they'll mix it into butter uh, and then they will flavor like uh, shortbread cookies or something like that. When you added the mushrooms to the cream, maybe I missed <laughs> it. Did you, did you add them? Um, did you rehydrate them? Did you cook them or did you I add rehydrate them? them in the cream? In the cream. Okay. Yeah. So you had the dried mushrooms right to the cream. Yeah. Do you have any advice on the, you know, whether you should rehydrate them and put them in a saute pan for certain applications or rehydrate them in your liquid that you're going to. Uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, I would say, you know, more, more likely I would do that with morels. I would rehydrate them and then I use the water for a broth to make a sauce and then I'll, I'll cook the morels a second time. So sometimes when I'm using dried mushrooms, I'll actually end up cooking them like two or three times. Uh oh. Oh, Julie froze. Hopefully Julie will come back. <laughs> um, we'll just give it a minute here. Um, it's interesting. Um, oh, there you are. Hi, Julie, you're back. Oh, we can't hear though. Can you hear me? Now we can there hear you. Are. you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Sorry about that. Okay. okay. So we, we, it's interesting. You, you you can rehydrate them in the liquid. Um, we've done a couple similar things. Um, we've definitely ground them up and cooked them into the liquid, and then either strained them out or left them in uh, in powder form. Mm -hmm. um, I notice if I don't strain the mushroom body out, there's a, you get just a little musky is the word I use. Like it has like mm -hmm. a mushroomy musky. Or, yeah. I don't know what the best is that, if that makes yeah, sense. That's a good word. Musky I'm is a, a good word. I, a, I call it earthy, mm -hmm. kind of earthy. Yeah. So, if you but if I strain it out, I don't seem to get that earthiness. I get more of a pure maple. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, and so, I'm not like. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, just smelling the, the, the jar of them I have here, um, that they definitely have a mapley character and an earthy note in there as well. Um, so that's my winemaker side <laughs> coming up. So uh, yeah, as far as um, doing them, like I have rehydrated them in like a rum or a vodka to make like a, almost like you would make a vanilla extract, you do a candy cap extract, and you can mm -hmm. use that for like, um, I use that for whipped cream when I want to flavor that. So um, lots of, lots of options. <laughs> yeah, we have a jar of um, whiskey that we did yeah. with candy caps. And it was what we, we started with, like, we didn't want to overdo it. Um, we started, we started with, with like two, two or, two or two three, three mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, and that wasn't enough. Probably a qu it, uh, maybe two thirds of a quart. I don't oh, know. Wow. It, okay. it, it ended up taking maybe six, seven, eight mushrooms to actually impart flavor. Yeah. And then I wasn't sure if we should strain them out. And I felt like we should because at a certain point, I, I don't know what 
why it would get better if, if the flavor is good to you. I didn't uh, want that I, sort of that muskiness to get in there. You can, it's sort of like, oh, I know what this is. It's, it's my candy cap <laughs> extract, you know, but um, there's really do no leave, reason. Oh, can you do you leave them in? Yeah, I can. Uh, I do leave them in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but that's specifically for that extract, but um, really uh, no need. So I'm thinking the other thing I make is a uh, simple syrup where mm. I will, it's equal parts sugar and water and I'll rehydrate the mushrooms in that syrup. But then I strain them out and then I candy the candy caps. Yeah. We have a picture will, of that. Yeah, so. Um, candy the candy I, caps. <laughs> what I'll do is, uh, have you ever made uh, like candied lemon or orange peel? So imagine they're, they're kind of tacky from mm -hmm. uh, being in that sugar syrup. Uh, I think the other, maybe go the other direction. Okay, give me a second here. I'm having a little technical difficulty. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's in there. Uh, yeah, there you there go. There they are. Yeah, oh. so that's the simple syrup that before I made that uh, with the candy caps, it was just sugar water. And then it turned that nice maple syrup brown. And then um, I take the mushrooms out and I toss them in sugar and and let them dry. So similar to that idea of the candied lemon peel or candied orange peel. Um, and then you can just eat them. <laughs> Here's um, the weird question though. You had yeah. them in this, I guess they cooked in the sugar water because you had that boiling on the stove at some point. Right. Yeah. Okay. How long did you, did you simmer that? Uh, I think, I think they, it was more like a steeping. So it wasn't like a, the syrup was hot and then I put the mushrooms in it. Um, so, you know, maybe a half an hour. Something well, like not, that. not that long. Oh. Then. No, uh -uh. Okay. Cause but, we did. You know, that's, that's a fair number of mushrooms there. Yeah. And we're not very experienced in this. We just like, Hey, let's make some syrup. We ground it up in the coffee grinder and oh, okay. then put it into the syrup pretty mm -hmm. quick. Um, and yeah. then strain the syrup through the, through like a, a cheesecloth. Cheese cloth. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it made a, not as dark as your syrup. It was certainly flavorful. Um, right. And then we just threw the powder out. This is ah. like way better. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then I was, uh, a friend of mine made a different version of candy caps where he actually starts with fresh mushrooms. And he uh, takes the sugar, like a cup of sugar to maybe uh, a good handful of candy caps and that are dried. I'm sorry, that are fresh, and then he makes a caramel. So he literally cooks the mushrooms in the sugar and maybe does like a, a teaspoon of water in there just to get things started. Um, but then, so my candied candy caps are kind of chewy and mm -hmm. his are not. So really he's got like a coating of caramel. Yeah. Oh, I lost you again. Oh. Somebody asked, uh, what ratio of mushrooms to alcohol do you use for the extract? We oh, were sorry, not... I lost you there. Sorry. Oh, did, okay. Oh, sorry. I was just reading a question from Kim on what oh, okay. ratio of mushrooms to alcohol do you use for the extract. And I want to say ours was not an extract. Ours mm -hmm. was a drinking whiskey um, mm -hmm. imbued with candy caps. And we did approximately 10 mushrooms to a quart of whiskey for uh, okay, a couple of I'm weeks. Thinking... Uh, I'm thinking more like maybe a pint of rum. I probably, you know, fill the pint jar with mm, a good handful. So it ends up looking like you're, it's full when they're rehydrated. Okay. Right? So you put yeah. a lot in, a lot more than we yeah. did, I think. Yeah. But I'm using it as an extract, similar to yeah. vanilla. Yeah. Right. And then okay. um, when I'm making the simple syrup, we made Manhattans with it. So oh, wow. We have like a candy are... cap Manhattan. <laughs> Sounds like amazing. The whiskey is pretty darn good, by the way. Candy caps and whiskey go well together. There you go. <laughs> I think. Yeah. It sure smells good. It does. It smells great. Um, now, I know we're kind of going down the, the, the preparation here. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, and I, I had one more I wanted to back up and share relating to Absolutely. the milk. Yeah. Um, we did the same thing, and I'm sorry to say we ground it up and threw it away after we soaked it. I, <laughs> I've learned a lot. Thank you. Um, uh, but I just don't worry though. We're, we, we, just to share, we, we haven't run out yet. <laughs> so awesome. We're doing we good. We had a good day. We had a couple good days after Soma. <laughs> yeah, nice. we did. Our luggage smelled so bad flying home with the candy oh, caps. Yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> anyhow, uh, we made popsicles, which was, which was, they were really good. Um, oh, interesting. And, you know, and a, a milk based, actually we did almond milk based. Was, was it almond? Was that the milk? It was almonds. Yeah. Yeah. They were good. And they were, they were really fun. Um, and we did them with Graham um, Steinruck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, al- we also Graham. made a uh, white chocolates with candy cat. With, oh, those freeze, super yeah. Yummy. With freeze dried raspberry. Uh, stuff dust. and then dust, <laughs> um, but the popsicles were good too. They were they were really seemed to be like right on with a, really a, a, a good use for the candy caps for us. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but to back it up even further, can we go back and talk about the habitats on where you find these? And and we did did a little bit with the wens, the yellow feet. Yeah. Um, um, let's talk all about the, all the different winter. Missions. A, so yeah, uh, yellow foot. Uh, if the winter chanterelle, the golden chanterelle, uh, the hedgehog, and the black trumpet, they all kind of come up at the same time. So they're all kind of indicators for each other. Okay. And then what, what we're, we're finding the um, uh, candy caps in, in Northern California with the tan oaks and the pine trees, right? I mean, that's where we found uh, them. Where I have found them, but I know other people find them with oak. But that may be, um, we may be talking about a different species with the oak that might be the rufulus and not the rubidus but yeah okay. Mm-hmm. okay and then we found them with i guess doug firs up in oregon um um kind of the middle of the state on the eastern r- r- eastern side of the coastal range so not too far from the ocean okay um and, and found i, a, a I find them north in the coastal region as well yeah okay the coastal I just don't know that you can find them anywhere else. <laughs> I don't either. I wonder if anybody is watching knows in the chat if they find them in other in other places because it sounds like they're really like if you go into the Cascades or go go into the next mountain range, you don't really find these guys. I I don't think so. I think that you you got to come visit us. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then. Um, the two types, if we want to type those in here, um, we have the Lactarius rufulus and the Lactarius rubidus. Yeah. Um, and and we, we alluded to that. They're, what's, I mean, what's, what's going on here? What's the problem? Why, why can't we sort this out? I, I, <laughs> you, I know the answer. It's a, you know. Why, do, why are they hard to tell the difference? Or what, what, do you, what are we sorting? <laughs> well, just here we are with another mushroom that you can't always tell what you're picking without being very, uh, very savvy between the, between the two edible species. Oh, I see. Is it the, I would say uh, there are a lot of character traits that tell me it's a candy cap. And probably, um, you know, the, the hollow stem, the particular color, the size the the slight aroma the matte finish on top um there's just and then the fact that they you can really break them with just your thumbnail um there's just nothing quite like that there are definitely some that are more like bendy when you try to use your thumbnail they won't break there's some that have the the yellow uh, latex um so you know there are some cues but so in my mind it's one of the easier mushrooms to identify have you found them to be universally flavorful? Um, I, I think we, we've heard from other people about, um, and kind of similar to Denise's story, like how overpowering the smell and the flavor was in her case. Have you ran into occasions when sometimes they bring more flavor than other, other times? Um, so I've talked to some people and uh, how you dry them seems to be um, significant. Uh, I, when I didn't have a dehydrator, I um, used to dry them in my oven. So I just, I have a gas oven and I would just have the pilot light or really low and um, just put them on a cookie sheet. Uh, The trick 
when you're drying them that way is they tend to get moldy a lot faster. So if they infect, the mold infects like one mushroom, you could, if you're not careful and you're not looking at your mushrooms, you may end up with a tray of moldy mushrooms. <laughs> so that's quite disappointing after all that work <laughs> that you get home and then you ruin them all by drying them too slowly. But I know some people use like just put them on a cookie sheet and under a fan and dry them that way because they feel strongly that um, the aroma goes away. Whereas I have a pretty cheap dehydrator and uh, it only has one temperature. So it's all either on or off and, and I've been using that for years and that's fine. <laughs> so um, this is a philosophical question. <laughs> yeah. We just, we ran ours all through the dehydrator and they seem to be pretty tasty. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just fine. Um, and then uh, there's a, a lot of philosophy actually on um, uh, the washing of the mushrooms. So some people feel like you, I'm in the camp that you bring the mushrooms home and you wash them and then you dry them. And there are other people that feel like when you rehydrate them, you're washing them. So they don't. Um, but I find you get a lot of sediment in the bottom of your pot and uh, I don't want to deal with that when I'm putting it in cream. <laughs> so, um, so I wash them beforehand. But is that, is that partially or even largely a function of the fact you're, you're a professional and you can't have sand going out on <laughs> in your uh, every, every once in a while I serve somebody some sand and they usually let me know <laughs> so <laughs> people people don't like sand in their food yeah <laughs> I've noticed when I hang out with people that pick mushrooms and they're they're chefs they mm -hmm. wash their mushrooms two or three times harder than we do uh, um, yeah you know, they really work them hard, it seems. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's just a, a function of, of how you often serve mushrooms to, to the public. So uh, maybe. But uh, the other thing is um, I wash mushrooms, and this is kind of a generalization about all mushrooms. I use a big bowl of water, and I toss the mushrooms in the water like I'm washing lettuce. So I don't, like, let them sit and hang out in the water, but I will toss them in the water and then pull them out of the water and kind of let them drip dry in my hand and then move them into another container. So um, I'm totally okay with that. And I, so I do that with every single mushroom I'm cleaning. I, I don't think there's a problem with too much water or, you know, I don't want to individually brush every yeah. candy cap. Just yeah, we're, we're washers too. I think generally <laughs> if, if, if there's grit on it or dirt, we're like, wash it and try to air dry it and if, you know, with some expediency and you know, it'll, it'll come back to normal in you know, half an hour. Or exactly. Or, long. you know, if it's a, a mud puppy, which is a chanterelle, yeah. <laughs> they yeah. may take more than half Dirty, hour. dirty. So yeah. dirty. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So if they're a little bit, is there a little bit of dirt on the very end of the mushrooms and I'll, I'll use a knife at home or something to, I, I literally sort through every single one to make sure there's not any funky ones in there. Uh, the other thing I, I've seen is sometimes just the way they're growing, they'll drop their spores from one to the next one. Uh -huh. um, so knowing the difference between mold and spores is, yeah. is important because so you're like, do I keep that one or not? Um, so we actually had a lot of that when we were hunting, uh, <laughs> them this year after soma the i think they were pretty mature so there were quite a few uh sport and their spores are white so it does kind mm -hmm. of look like mold a exactly. little bit um yeah. i don't know a good way to tell the difference maybe just the smell because mold has that classic kind of exactly you know, or you moldy know, they, smell they they're kind of waterlogged when they're going bad so they 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 look waterlogged or kind of old yeah. and tired yeah yeah Here's a question from Julia. Um, she asked, she says she's heard that stems can be more, more bitter than the cap. Um, do you, have you found this to be true? Do you remove the stem before preserving? Uh, I use them whole, but they're small mushrooms. So um, I've never separated the cap from the stem on, in this particular mushroom. Are I, there any I, mushrooms you do? Uh, for porcini, I would do that for sure. Mm. Uh, so there's lots of of talk about which part is the most flavorful on a porcini. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, 
some people think it's the sponge and some people think it's uh, the cap or, or the stem, you know, so they, they'll dissect it. But for a mushroom this small, uh, I'm not. <laughs> well, you're not going to get to evade that now. Now that you threw that out there, what do you, what do you think? Do you have a, uh, when you separate the porcini? the porcini, what's your, <laughs> you know, you... Um, if, if I have uh, more green on the sponge, then um, I'm going to separate it out because what I'll do is I'll dehydrate the sponge by itself and then I'll make porcini powder with it. Yeah. Um, and I may, you know, if the rest of it is good, then I, I'm probably going to cook that up and just eat it. <laughs> so what do you do if there's a bug? Depends on how many I have, right? Yeah. What, what do you do if there's <laughs> bugs in it? Uh, that's a really Cut good... them out. Cut them out. Hey, let her answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she's a bug eater. I, it's the, the quantity of bugs <laughs> that makes it significant. If there's only a few little specks there, I'm, I'm just going to eat it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and that's okay. Those of you that are in the, you know, in the <laughs> webinar here, if you eat bugs, that's cool with us. <laughs> kind, kinda. <laughs> so, uh, so no, so you don't remove. Have you? Have you? Um, I, I'm curious. Have you ever heard the stem is more bitter than the cap or, on these? I've, I've never heard anyone bring that up. Yeah. So I, I have heard that some people are like, oh, they're very bitter, and I think sometimes that's because there's at least one that's not the right mushroom in the batch. Yeah, I bet that's oh. what it is. Yeah, they might have slipped in a, another type of lactarius in there, which is easy. I remember when we came home with a bag, I, I had one in there that was not the right type. Um, and as we were cleaning it through, we were like, oh, this is not cool. Well, and it, they, when you've looked at enough of them, they, they look significantly different. Mm -hmm. But when you're out yeah. in the woods quickly picking, uh, they, they may get past you. Yeah, I get a little craziness in my eyes sometimes and just mm -hmm. start what? picking nah. and picking and going crazy when there when there's that many. <laughs> the main but, the mania. The question is when you fall asleep, do you see the candy caps in your eyes? <laughs> ah. Oh, we definitely yeah. I definitely do that with morels for sure. <laughs> yeah. I haven't mm -hmm. well, I don't think we've picked enough candy caps to see candy caps. <laughs> Haven't been that lucky yet. <laughs> yeah, I'd I'd say it takes about mm, three days of picking any mushroom for me to start having the dreams. Okay, so you got at least to go go one more time. <laughs> yeah, well, three days in a row. Three days in oh, a row. Okay. But they, they do they do come the dreams. Oh, yeah. for sure. Do um, when you um, as a, as a, I guess a professional chef, can you talk a little bit about the commercial market for these? And are do you, do you see them out in the, you know, in the world being served at restaurants very much? I I, I know where we are. I, uh -huh. Kristen, have you have you ever is that a big yawn there, Kristen? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I ran out of tea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we really have ever seen them in a restaurant, but you know we are in Colorado. No, we're in Colorado. I think that's you know only fair they don't grow here and somebody would have to purchase them they're wickedly expensive when you are looking so, at it from a distance when um when i'm doing the soma which stands for sonoma county mycological association um when i do the soma mushroom camp in january we have a uh, wild mushroom camp and i make a feast for about 270 people um we tend to have uh, candy cap desserts for that. And so we buy them because nobody can pick enough for them. So uh, we, we buy them, I think, I wanna say we either buy, we buy about a pound dried. So I can't even imagine how many mushrooms that is to come up with a pound. It's a lot. So it's a lot, and, uh, but we're, we're making dessert for a lot of people. <laughs> so it feels like it, it works out in the end. But um, so I know we, we're we buying them from um, Eric Schramm in at Mendocino <coughs> Mushroom Company. Um, so you can look him up. But he, if he doesn't have them, then, you know, it makes it really hard. So I'm thinking maybe you could probably get them from, um, uh, there's a, several different um, mushroom vendors in, in the Bay Area. So uh, Connie Green has Wine Forest, and um, there I think there's I'm blanking on the name of the one in the in the 
uh, Ferry Building in San Francisco. I'll think of their name. But uh, so there are a couple of people that sell uh, either wholesale to restaurants or commercially uh, you can get them. But um, so it is possible. And I think uh, here in Sonoma County, we have a couple of different um, restaurants that are known and probably Napa as well that are in, known for serving dishes that have mushrooms in them. So they're kind of, people have a following for those restaurants. And also uh, there's a couple ice cream shops. The one in uh, Sebastopol called Screaming Mimi's comes to mind. Ah, thank you, Beth, Ooh. Far West Fungi. Um, so they, uh, they make ice cream. So the creme anglaise recipe that I sent you, um, you can share with people, that's okay. And um, that you can take that grandma glaze and make your own ice cream. <laughs> so mm. you have candy cap ice cream. Um, so, so it gets used and and commercially, you know, there's some small ice cream makers. Um, we had uh, um, Aiva says she's had candy cap kombucha in Berkeley. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's some distilleries and and brew pubs maybe using it. Yeah, um, yeah. So definitely uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, we're all avid fans of it. So um, <laughs> I, with the relish events that I do, uh, I regularly make some kind of dessert, usually chocolate cake with creme anglaise and um, candy cap whipped cream. So uh, I've served lots of people. Okay. We'll have and to how can that be bad? Out. Chocolate cake, creme anglaise and whipped cream. I mean, three super yummy things. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Add a little candy cap and voila. So, uh, and so I know occasionally people cheat and so they'll use the candy caps and then they're, they're afraid that they haven't made it maple enough. So they'll also use maple uh, syrup. Uh, we've no, we've no totally to done that. <laughs> we've, we've, well, we've, we did that in scones. <laughs> yeah, I won't. Scones. Cause you have to have sugar in it. So we're like, oh, yeah, let's use maple exactly, syrup. for the sugar, for the sugar. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey Trent I think Beth hey Beth Beth had a couple questions about the um, species differentiations Rufulus versus Rubidus and she mm -hmm. says uh, early on um, she heard that, that you could eat the Rufulus but it's the second class citizen to the Rubidus but still edible. <laughs> Have you heard that? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but it's possible. I think yeah. I haven't had as much of it, of the rufulus. Also, she thought rufulus might have a solid stem over the hollow stem of the rubidus. You found them last year, Beth, the rufulus? I don't know the answer to that one. She says, yeah. I don't know that uh, any of us know the answer to that one. Um, oh, I, I think I, I have that resource that you shared, Julie, yeah. that is just awesome. Um, uh, I'll click on it here and maybe we can okay. we'll pop, I'll pop the link into the chat first. Uh, okay. Here it is for everybody. Um, and it's called a primer on candy caps. Hmm. Um, and I'm just going to share this now. Yeah. And, um, Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, You're and I'm a yeah, fan of, of cr Christian Schwartz. <laughs> he, he clearly knows a little something about mushrooms in your area. That's right. <laughs> um, this is a really and nice Siegel, PDF. By the way. Uh -huh. And Noah, Noah as well. <laughs> Although only Christian's name is on this PDF in particular. You, you know, obviously they co-wrote the book and they have uh, the link I gave you has a couple of other good uh, PDFs that they wrote together on it. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a really nice write-up. I think you guys all can scroll, uh, show it. It really breaks down both types, mm. the ru rubidus, yeah. uh, rubidus and then the rufulus. And if you keep going, it even has a little quiz, which I think is the coolest thing ever. Like, which one's <laughs> this? Yeah. Um, so if you want to study it, this, this is like an exceptional guide to, to look into. I, I put the link in there and at the website, uh, if any of you are maybe watching on Facebook or not able to see that is redwoodcoastmushrooms.org. And if you just search it for uh, candy caps, it's this primer on candy caps. 
and yeah. uh, it, it's really so quite excellent. They definitely, just looking at those pictures, uh, they definitely look different to me. But mm -hmm. I know that if you're, you know, walking around in the woods, they look really similar. Mm -hmm. But that one, if you're pointing to, it looks definitely looks more of a solid stem. So yeah. uh, that one, I think he was saying, um, is located more in Southern California. So not as common in the area where I, I'm foraging. And it's really just beefy and meaty, you know, though, compared to the yeah. uh, thinner, it, you the, know. That one has more of a, sometimes like a ruffly edge right that here. the other one mm -hmm. uh, doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And here's the other one again, which has more mm -hmm. of a smooth edge. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, there, there's very, they're very similar. Uh, but here, here it is. If if you really want to learn more about it, this resource is is exceptional. So. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Perfect. If you want to go um, geeky, you can. Yeah. Now let's talk before we, you know, we before we wrap. I want to talk a little bit about the recipes. Um, okay. You emailed us a, a recipe to share. Mm -hmm. Um. I think what we'll do is post it up to Facebook uh, with the, with this event. Um, that's fine. Yeah. If that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the recipe. Sure. Um, it was the cream. The creme anglaise. Yeah. Creme anglaise. Um, so what is creme anglaise? And walk us through a little bit about making it, and then I'll, I'll show the recipe here uh, partway through. Oh, okay. So you want me to remember it? <laughs> well, just generally, yeah. Just talk about it a little bit. I've made it a lot. That's totally fine. So um, before I start doing anything, I'll take the cream and steep the candy caps in it. Somebody was asking about, uh, does there need to be heating step to enhance the flavor? Uh, not really. <laughs> Once they're dried, um, the flavor comes out on the candy caps. But um, I like to steep it because it's behaving uh, kind of like tea and in infusing the, the cream with the, that candy cap flavor. Okay, so then um, I'm also telling you to take your sugar and your egg yolks and whisk them together. So it's critical that once you add the sugar to the egg yolks, don't delay. You want to actually be fully prepared to make this um, so because there's kind of a chemical reaction between the sugar and the yolks. If you just sit them there, then the yolks won't behave like you want them to. So um, once you add the sugar to the yolks, um, keep going. So um, I've got my cream and my candy caps sitting there steeping, and I, then I strain it out. And then um, I actually slowly add the hot cream to the sugar yolk mixture because uh, you don't want to make scrambled eggs. So you're whisking and slowly adding it. And then once you have all that cream in there, then you take your empty pot that you use for the steeping and you put that whole mix of sugar yolks and cream back in there. And then you stir it over medium heat until um, it goes and basically until if you took a spoon and you dipped it in it and you rub your finger across the back of the spoon, it leaves a stripe on the back. So if it, if it doesn't make that stripe and it kind of comes back together, you haven't cooked it long enough. The other thing you'll see is um, while you're whisking, the texture of the um, sauce changes. So you'll start out really foamy. And then as you're cooking it, the foams will kind of subside. And so that's another cue that it's just about ready. And then you should also have um, an ice water bath sitting there ready. So as soon as you get the texture you want, uh, you pour through a strainer into a bowl that's sitting inside the water bath uh, so you can cool it down right away. Uh, because in this case, again, you can make scrambled eggs. So that's all the ingredients that are there, cream, sugar, and egg yolks. Um, and then you have sauce. So it's how it's much candy sweet. cap do you think you use in this with what's it say um, two two cups of cream? I would say I think you could probably get away with one or two ounces of dried. It's not a lot. So it feels like or you you reuse thing. them in your case. You and might then pull I them out them. of your freezer. 
I've, ready yes, to go. Exactly. So I've, I've used them five times in a row and still gotten the, the flavor. That one looks almost fresh. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you can start with the infusion from the dried and then uh, take them out and put them in the freezer, at which point they're wet. And the next time you use them from a moist mushroom, they still retain that maple yeah. flavor. So, yeah. so is it true then that once they are dried, they are no longer going to sort of impart that curryness that you yeah. might get from the fresh, yeah. exactly. even yeah. if they're rehydrated and used again and again? Right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. just so interesting, I think. <laughs> I can't explain the chemistry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe we can have Zach Mazzy on uh, and talk about uh, yeah, chemical could. change when things get dried. He, he he's into that. He um, is, yeah. <laughs> that would be a fun one. Hey, we have a question here about this this recipe in particular. Um, Kim asked, "Do you think this would work with coconut milk?" Uh, I haven't tried it, but uh, I don't see why not. I think it would probably be fine. Yeah, give it a go. Well. Okay, um, and then, yeah, I don't I don't see why it wouldn't. Okay, and then we have a recommendation the, for me. The egg yolk itself is is the emulsifier, so I think once you, and you oh. I think we lost her. We did lose Again. her. She'll be back though. Hopefully. Yeah, she'll be back. Are you back? Sorry. Yep, you're I, back. I, all of a sudden, you didn't move. <laughs> so, um, so with the coconut, the egg yolk is the emulsifier. So I think if you had a can of coconut milk, you'd have the separation of the water and the cream. Uh, so probably, you know, just either shake the can or whisk it so that you have a, all of it is the same. Um, and then you can steep and do everything as you would normally. Um, yeah. I don't see that as a problem. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, have you ever had candy cat beer? I haven't, but I see someone in your comments. comments. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, Ethan D. said he highly recommends a candy cat beer from Old Town Brewing in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, OTBrewing.com. Nice. <laughs> that sounds good. Right about now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take one of those. <laughs> do you think, do you, think um, you know, we, 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 something happens when, when, they, when we dry them. Uh, they they some, something happens to these mushrooms to bring out this this wonderful smell. Do you yeah. think um, they last a long time in a in a dried state? I know, like a lot of our mushrooms, seem to just age very gracefully over the years mm -hmm. when they're dried. Um, so, you... uh, and I have I've kept porcini a lot longer as far as years than I have candy caps, just by chance. Um, and actually, with with porcini, they get kind of a richer flavor as they age. So they go from mildly mushroomy to kind of a chocolatey kind of character as they age. Um, so I know that dried mushrooms sometimes improve over time. Um, so I don't, I don't see it as a problem. The only thing I've noticed is uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of the plastic bag. So it seems like over time the bag kind of disintegrates and so you kind of end up with a lot of dust at the bottom of your bag like the mushrooms are not aging as well but uh, in a jar they they seem to do very well so lately I've been taking uh, the desiccant that I have um, you know let's say I get some vitamins or whatever so I've been um, taking that desiccant Can you see it? Mm -hmm. see it? yep yep and uh and I've been putting it in my jar, and then they stay nice and dry. So if you feel like your, dry, your mushrooms aren't staying as dry, then, then that's a recommendation. Yeah, I put a desiccant in every jar of mushrooms I have. Um, and for a tip, you can buy them uh, for everyone listening on Amazon. They're pretty cheap. Just make sure you get the food, the food safe ones mm -hmm. um, that can come in contact with your food. But, you know, it seems like for 20 cents, it's a good investment in a a jar of mushrooms. Exactly. So yeah, in my case, I don't buy any. They just come in in my vitamins. <laughs> so. You know, what? we we've we've kind of stopped storing in plastic too over the years, and and would mm -hmm. note the same thing that, boy, stored in a 
a, a good Ziploc bag is just not good after a year. Um, and I've noticed the same thing, like there's a lot of residue and powder inside the plastic bag that like in a jar like this, this is like really clean and there's no powder. I feel like yeah. if this were in a Ziploc bag, there'd be this. It's like powder. a funky residue on the bottom. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if, if some, there's some kind of reaction taking place with the yeah. dried mushrooms. I'm not sure, but I, I, uh. I love a good jar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and we, uh, I, I stored some matsutake last year in plastic, dry dried them, which just to experiment with, um, and mm -hmm. found the ones in plastic lost of more of their aroma than the ones that weren't in plastic that were in glass. They, yeah, that makes sense. They just Here, didn't. Here's a, a random strange wine making fact. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you have cork taint in a bottle of wine. If you have what? Cork taint, you know, the oh, cork tri taint. Yeah, do you know that? Okay. It's a trichloroanisol. Yeah. It's a, a reaction between the cork and bleach. So oh. um, it's like uh, if you smell like musty cardboard, something like that. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll get that in wine. And if you took a, a piece of, of saran wrap and you put it in, a, in your bottle of wine, the plastic would absorb the cork taint. And then what? When, yeah, exactly. No <laughs> way. Random trivia like that. So wow. um, yeah, so I'm I'm just thinking that the plastic is actually absorbing some aroma from your mushrooms. So yeah, I'm I'm not a fan of using the plastic. Yeah, we have a comment that even uh Bale jars don't work for, well, I think ball jars don't work for preserving mushrooms because the seal is not airtight over time. Interesting. So one of my jars is just a, I'm a huge fan of <laughs> artichokes. <laughs> so um, this is my, my uh, secret love at Costco. <laughs> so I always have lots of these jars and the labels are hard to get off. So they stay Can you get on. the smell out of them so they don't affect your yeah. mushrooms? I mean, I wash them in the washing machine and, or dishwasher uh -huh. and, uh, and then I use them. Yeah. So this is a, these are pretty good size as well. Yeah, we do. We do a lot of these mason mason jars and these jars, and they seem to last pretty pretty good. Um, I yeah. will also um, I will use I will say when it comes to plastic, I, I'm curious what you think about this. Um, I'm only talking about Ziplocs when I've used those nice vacuum seal bags. Um, oh. I feel like they behave just like glass, and I do have uh, quite a few mushrooms in long term storage and in. Um, good vacuum seal plastic bags and I, it must be a different plastic um now I, I can't say for sure 10 years down the road if i regret that but uh right now they they, they don't get the same problems as ziplocs mm -hmm. um, so yep but definitely you know for short term if you sometimes i use like the little snack bags because i only dried a small quantity yeah. on that mm -hmm. day uh, so in the short term, I, I think that's fine, but over time, I would move them into something else. Okay, and Nicole just uh, clarified, she meant the uh, uh, bell to, uh, yeah, uh, the rubber. She's talking about the ones with the rubber seal uh, that yeah. degrades and yeah, those definitely. Because okay. I'm using a, a ball jar, so it's got, you know, it has, let's try that yeah. one. <laughs> it's got the rubber, I'm looking for my camera, there we go. Oh, lower, um, lower. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, it's got a little bit of the rubber on the inside, but it you seem pretty sealed tight. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're gonna that that I'm pretty sure that jar is gonna outlast me. <laughs> so we're lucky in Colorado too. We have like yeah. zero percent humidity here, so we could leave our jars open to the air and they'd be fine. But uh, they obviously might lose some aroma and whatnot over time. But they would never get moldy or anything like that. Well, right now just... it's, it's like uh, 95 degrees here. So maybe today we'd, we'd be in the same boat. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> You know, that reminds me of something else I've heard. I think from two different people. I feel like I feel like Alan Burgo told us this, and maybe Eleanor too, Eleanor Shabbats. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they they said they I think it was Alan that said it first. They um, like to slow uh, air, put their candy caps out in the air for a day or two, let them absorb moisture from the air slowly, and that's what pops their flavor. 
Oh, oh so you take them out of the jar before you use them. And Eleanor think. talked about that. She's pretty into, uh, knows a lot about dried mushrooms and how she uses it to coax better flavor out of her mushrooms. And ideally she'll open them up to the air a day or two before she plans on using them for like maximum flavor, which I, I thought was interesting. Interesting. So uh, I was thinking, I haven't tried this, but uh, if you were going to use uh, dried spices and you've had your jar of, I don't know, cardamom or coriander or whatever for a long time, uh, people will put them in a dry saute pan and just toast them a little bit and it'll bring the aroma back. So uh, I've never tried that on a, on a dried mushroom, but it might, it might work as well. Might work. But you, you can rejuvenate spice by just kind of heating it in a pan, perhaps? Toasting? You can. <laughs> yep, yep. Hmm. Nice. Good tip. Another one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, let's see. I think, uh, did we have a, was that the, uh, did we have another recipe that we needed to put up or is that, is that, that's uh, what we, we had? had a, I think we yeah. had a, maybe and the candy. picture of the, Poached pears for you. Okay. Oh, the Let pears me get... with anglaise. anglaise. Oh, okay. Because it's so using the creme anglaise. I will pull that up here. Okay. If you give me a minute. Okay, I have a question for you, Julie, while Trent's looking for that photo. Because okay. you are a winemaker and a forager, which we, you know, you're the first one we've encountered. I would <laughs> love to hear your thoughts about terroir in terms of mushrooms because we like to use that term a lot when we're thinking of of mushrooms and i think about it a little bit differently than um a winemaker might uh -huh. or someone that appreciates wine because to yeah. me um and maybe you i'll let you explain terroir in a second but to okay. me um instead of just recalling uh you know maybe the for the smell of the forest and the leaf litter and you know the moisture levels and whatnot uh it also recalls the the whole experience so mm -hmm. i like to wrap it all together into mm -hmm. like an experiential terroir um mm -hmm. where i remember you know the day and the camaraderie and the weather and everything that was going on so mm -hmm. talk mm -hmm. to me about that because i think it's a really relevant number one and just kind of a fun thing that yeah. Could well, it's wine and mushrooms. Because um, so terroir is uh, uh, gives you a sense of place. So they always talk about um, wines from different regions that are the same grape variety taste different. So let's say you had Cabernet from Bordeaux versus Napa, the wines it's the same grape variety, but they don't taste the same. So I I do think there's some aspect of that is terroir and some of that is style. Um, but, and also, you know, I can buy grapes and my neighbor can buy the same grapes from the exact same block and this next row over and make wine and they will taste different. There's a sort of just gestalt of it's, it tastes like that place, but it also has some of my style along with it. So it's kind of, a combination of terroir and also uh, winemaker influence because maybe I'm doing a different temperature in the fermentation or I'm using a different yeast or my tank mm -hmm. is a different size or you know stuff like that. So as far as um, mushrooms I'm thinking uh, let's say porcini from California versus Colorado we're talking about a different species so part of that is is that but part of that is um that they're from a different place different time of year uh different soil types different aspects that sort of thing so i do think there's um some of the flavor profile that we're tasting has to do with where it came from for sure yeah so it's a complicated question <laughs> yeah. I think it, it triggers it triggers something almost emotional to smell. Like I'm just like what I remember when I smell this is you know I have these memories associated with this. Absolutely. Um, you know, finding them and the camaraderie yeah. part too. It. Yeah, but it, it, I mean, at the same time, there is that that recall of sense of place and in, in this idea that it really connects you back to mm -hmm. uh, the environment and in in 
gives you this, you know, just really deep appreciation for your food. And Mm -hmm. I I love that about it. And, you know, it's kind of a loose interpretation of terroir. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) The wine people are probably wouldn't (laughs) like it too much, but (laughs) we're okay with it. (laughs) We we have one, (laughs) but I'm okay with it. (laughs) Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Let me um let me pop this up now. I got it ready. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, uh, so pretty. Thank I'll you. I'll zoom in. See if I can zoom in on the. So uh, yeah. Oh, nice. So I poached those pears. Um, I can't remember doing anything mushroomy to the pears. They were just uh, I think I used uh, dessert wine and maybe like some cinnamon and cloves. Uh, I could probably look up a recipe for you if you like for the pears themselves uh, but the creme anglaise with the candy cap is the sauce the yellowy sauce it's yellowy because of the egg yolks and then the, the candy cap whipped cream and then just for fun i i make what i call bewitched chanterelles so they're actually um first i roast them then i steep them in a um a, blanket on well it was vermouth it was a sweet vermouth that had vanilla bean and cinnamon and clove in it so I steeped the warm mushrooms in that for probably about half an hour and then I strain them back out and then I put them in a jar and I cover it with apricot brandy and so they were aged for about a year in the apricot brandy wow pretty great I know right that's a chanterelle (laughs) Um, so, so it's kind of a fun mushroomy kind of a dessert, um, but I'm happy to share with you um, any of, of those things that are on that plate. <laughs> so can we, I mean, anglaise, the idea of it, basically you could put that into an ice cream maker and turn it into ice cream. It's kind of like Absolutely. raw ice cream. It would be you? like uh, French vanilla. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because mm-hmm. of all the eggs, that's what makes it French vanilla. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of egg yolks. If you look at back. At yeah. The we recently made uh, Alan Burgos uh, spruce tip ice cream and, you know, loosely that was a similar base. Um, yeah. I mean, it's and, a classic French recipe, you know, yeah, gosh, that was it for a couple hundred years. <laughs> so good. It was so good. Yeah. Spruce tips are fun. I yeah. gotta say. Especially when we live in Colorado and it's so dry, there's there's no mushrooms. Yeah, to be and it's had, like the so only thing we can forage. We're getting creative. <laughs> I'm I'm going out looking for beer cans next. <laughs> oh come on, we've been getting asparagus for a month. Don't yeah. don't be so sad. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Okay, pretty so good. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to wrap here. Um, uh, thanks so much for sharing all your your oh, happy to wisdom share. and information uh, on this. It's, it, it's been a lot of fun. Where, I know it's a weird year, year, where might we run into you in the next, if not this season, next season? T- tell us a little bit about the, the, the events you attend regularly. Oh, attending? Or, uh, or, or cooking at. Yeah. I, or, I, wish, yeah. I wish I could just attend. I like that idea. <laughs> so, um, I will be doing... Um, I'm thinking I'm a member of SOMA and the MSSF uh, mushroom organization. So I, I do attend those, both of those uh, meetings. I used to be on the SOMA board for about 12 years. Uh, I'm a, I do the Myco Ventures events, but we just did a morale foray to the foothills. So it'll be a while. Uh, we probably won't do our next foray until the fall. Um, and then uh, I'll be doing some events with Relish Culinary Adventures again, but um, you can find me uh, on my website, or you can find me um, through the Myco Ventures website. Um, if they anybody wants, um, I email out when we're doing events, so you can join me. We do um, these forays to the to Salt Point and the Sonoma Coast, and um, I'm happy to have people come along. That's great. Um, so and then I get on that list. Yeah, me. <laughs> me, send too, me, me too. Send me your email address, and I'll add you to the mailing list. <laughs> but um, uh, as I said, I if you want to bring mushrooms to my house and cook with me, I'm happy. 
too. <laughs> so then maybe in January, you'll probably be at SOMA, assuming, exactly. that, assuming yep. it happens. We're, I'm hoping that they do camp this year, but um, I've been the camp chef at SOMA camp for the last nine years. So um, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, at, for that event, uh, in the past, I've cooked for um, a NAMA event. I've cooked for David Aurora for his Thanksgiving event. I've done uh, many different uh, mushroom related things. So uh, I cook mushrooms a lot, but um, so it just depends. But if you email me, I'm happy to, to tell you what I'm doing so you can come eat something that I've cooked. Okay. Maybe well, you can come to NAMA in Colorado next year. That would be awesome. Oh. Is it next year in Colorado? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not 2021. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. What, what month is that? It'll be the week before August. or after um, tel uh, the Telluride Festival we hear. And I think it'll be the week after. No, mm -hmm. the week before. I think it'll be the week before. Yeah. But it's not r totally clear yet. So it's either <laughs> the first the first or the third week in August, one of the two. Okay. So, so we've heard. Uh, I have fun. some dilemmas because Sauvignon Blanc usually gets oh. later on then. But um, I, I've been wanting to forage in Colorado for years. I was actually born in Denver. And uh, when I lived there, I never picked one mushroom. <laughs> so that oh, came let's later. Fix that. When I, yeah, you can later. come visit us anytime, girl. <laughs> We're right. here. You don't have to. A, I mean, I would well, love you have to come during the season, which is somewhere between mid-July and mm, mid-September, let's yeah. say. And my family would probably not be happy if I didn't visit them while I was there too. <laughs> but, um, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. do they pick mushrooms? Uh, no. <laughs> there you go. What's, what's the, <laughs> we, what's the we problem? Can, we, we can convert them, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so we'll look forward to seeing you in Soma because I'm sure we'll be uh, we'll be uh, watching that. And for those of you that haven't done it, it's a spectacular event. Mm -hmm. It's affordable. It's it, a crazy, crazy good food. Really smart people. Um, and if you want to go, buy tickets the day they go on sale because um, it always sells out. I think that's so, true. Yeah, it's it's been selling out for the last decade at least. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a really mm -hmm. fun event. We're, we were lucky to go. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks again, and uh, thanks, thanks everybody Julie. for 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 joining us, and we'll and see you. Um, hey, Trent. Right? There were no oh, yeah, no. We should talk about. Do we yeah, before question? you before you let everyone go, um, tell everyone about Thursday. Oh yeah, Thursday we have oh. Trad Cotter uh, uh, on on the series, and um, Trad wrote the book on cultivation and organic mushroom farming. And he does a lot with cordyceps and psilocybin and um, uh, all kinds of growing technology and medicine. Really, really a fascinating guy. So we're, we're excited to have him next uh, Thursday. That's two days from now. Two days. <laughs> so. And Julie, thank you so yeah. much. Oh, you're, you're welcome. awesome. Oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge. And, Happy uh, to. Happy to. Okay. Hopefully we'll see you in Colorado one of these days. Yeah, I'd love to do that. <laughs> okay, bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.